path along life's highway So common and well trod By the shoes of burdened Christians Who won't put their trust in God Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce. So glad to be with you today. Uh, I heard a saying the other day, and I thought it was worth repeating to you because so many people take things out of context. I mean, it happens all the time. It happens in the news level. It, uh, it happens uh, in the Christian world. I mean, we're always grabbing a verse here and there and taking it out of context. But uh, the saying that I heard, and I'm not sure where I heard this, actually, when you do it, you're making a pretext. Well... What does pretext mean? And I looked it up in Webster, and this is what it means. A motive alleged or an appearance assumed in order to cloak the real intention or the state of affairs. So it's, it can, it's a cloak so that people can deceive you by just giving you partial truth. And it's leaving out a lot of the information so that they can make their point. I mean, we see people do that all the time. They'll... Somebody will even hear our program here and they'll take one line that I've said and then they'll say, oh, she's saying this and she's saying that. Well, that's, those are just the devil's lies. And uh, hopefully, if you want to truly know what we're teaching, you get on the website and you can see what we're saying in, on, in our written material. It's not just me. I've got, there's many authors. And uh, by the way, some of the great authors are Watchman Nee and, um, and actually A.B. Simpson. And he, of course, was the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance Church. And let me tell you this. Um, one time years ago, I was in Pennsylvania teaching. And I was, it was at this older couple's house, a big, huge house in uh, Pennsylvania. And they were missionaries. And so as I was teaching, the man... Her Harold was his name, said to me, oh, wait a minute, I've got to go up to my library because I think what you're saying is the same thing that our founder said and, and where I learned when I went to uh, missionary school, went to the seminary. And so he went up to the third floor where his library was and he pulled out a bunch of books. And sure enough, that the author was A.B. Simpson. And so, and he started saying, oh my goodness, this, you're teaching exactly the same thing that our founder taught. And I said, well, I think, you know, a lot of people have forgotten exactly what your founder taught and that what we want to do is revitalize and bring back to, uh, to, to life what some of these people years ago began to teach and the foundation of a lot of ministries. So, um, uh, he wrote songs and wrote great things. Now, why would that be obscured in history and forgotten? Well, because there's so many diversions and so many things taken out of context and so much law putting on people or, or uh, license, license given to this and that, you see. We need to be followers of Christ and what Christ says and the apostles laid down these principles. So let's keep... Keep what we're saying in context. That's why we like to go through a whole uh, book. I mean, there's times that I love to jump all over the Bible to prove what I'm saying, but basically, I think it's really expedient to go verse by verse to see exactly what Paul is saying and what these apostles John and James and the rest of the apostles are saying because they're, they're certainly laying down the foundations that I think some of us have lost, these foundations. We need to go back to the great foundations of the great founders. I think that people are saying that about our country today. That's probably true. All right, I'm in chapter 12, and I'm going to be reading verse 25. I talked about the gifts of the Spirit last time. And this is what he says in verse 25, that, that there should be no schism or more no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. So it's not about dividing because of the uh, the gifts of the Spirit. It's a, and no division. I mean, he 
uh, uh, admonished him in the beginning of the, his letter by saying, you know, you're yet carnal because you're dividing. You're saying that a group of you, you're of Apollos, and a group of you, you're of Paul, and you're of this person, you're of that person. He says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you all. You all, you know, would, would think that uh, you were of me or something. And he said, we're, we're the apostles. We're just the messengers. That's the point. We're the messengers that's laying down the foundational truths of the beginning of Christianity, and this certainly was the beginning. And maybe we're coming to the to um, the end when the Lord, uh, with the shout, comes in the second time. And we're going to be talking about that too a little bit. I'm not going to go into the depths of end time teaching like the eschatologists do. I always say that we'll let Hal Lindsey and David Reagan and you know some of those guys really bring forth those truths. But I certainly will give my bits on on what I think the Bible is saying. So, but, but look what it says in verse 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And one member be honored, all, all members rejoice with it. You see? So it's not about just an individual person getting an honor and elevating one person up against the other. And I think that's kind of an American mentality that uh, we're all independent and we've got to do our own thing. Well, it's okay to be um, to have your own gift, that's for sure. But we cannot forget that we're really one multi-membered body of Christ. We're not separated; we're one. So, and I know I knew this uh, woman that says, "I just want uh, the body of Christ to be one." And I said, "Well, the Bible says we are one. We just get to know what we already are. You, you can't try to make it what it already. If you start trying to make it, then you're trying to fix." what God has already declared to be one. So we really already are one. Now are now you are the body of Christ and the members in particular. So there so uh yes, uh it's kinda like a hologram. Um uh the part has the whole and the whole has the part, you see. So we're really a, a whole because there's only one body, but yet each part has the fullness as well. So Hallelujah, that's, that's a great way to put it. So, um, and ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So there are particular different callings, but we don't need to be puffed up about, about that. And that's the context of what he's saying here. And God has set forth in the church, first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now he says this, he says, are all apostles? He's saying that not everybody is an apostle. I mean, that's there's diversions and uh, there's different particular gifts that are given. So not everybody is. Don't be true to what God has called you to. If it's, um, and be satisfied with what Jesus, what the Spirit is using you for. Don't, you know, pine after greater gifts so that you can get some kind of personal glory. We're, this is not about getting personal glory for anything. You see, and it says, are, are all prophets? Not everybody's a prophet, although, you know, we might prophesy here or there. Are all teachers? Not everybody's a teacher, okay? Are all workers of a miracles? No, not everybody's the same. We're not meant to be the same. The ear's not meant to be the mouth. The mouth's not meant to be the toe, and so forth. Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? So, I mean, I think it's wrong to say you must, you know, speak in tongues a certain way. And I'm not going to go there because that's a lot of controversy in that. Do not, do all interpret? We might not have that gift. This is what I love. Of course, we're moving into the love chapter, chapter 13. Uh, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, I believe. It says... But co covet earnestly the best gifts. But wait a minute, wait a minute. And Paul says this, yet I show you a more excellent way. Now, what is the more excellent way? It's the way of love. I mean, even if you don't feel like you have many gifts at all or any gifts or you, don't, you can't define it or whatever, you know, the more excellent way is sacrificial love. And a lot of times in the body of Christ, we put put down, we make, we make uh, people, uh, and it, it says that in chapter, um, 
in chapter 14, it talks about um, uh, the different people. Oh, no, it's in chapter 12. He says this. He says, And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. So sometimes we set aside our old people, or older people, or people that are crippled, or people that are blind, or people that have problems, or people that have disabilities. You know, we set them aside. I love what, that. see, God is just fair. He's just wonderfully fair. And he says, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon this, this we bestow much more abundant honor. You honor those people. Bless their hearts. You honor them, you see. And our uncom uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. They're more honored by God even. For our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacks, because God is fair. That's, that's so wonderful of the Lord. So, but, so let's, let's, the scripture is saying here, let me teach you the more uh, uh, excellent way. What's the more excellent way? Let's, let's, in chapter 13, the love chapter, we know that, the agape love chapter. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I have become as sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. I'm just like some tin plate. You see, there's no power behind that. There's power in love. The greatest power in the universe is the power of love. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and might be all puffed up because of all my understanding and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, like I feel like I could move mountains because I have faith, and so that I might even remove mountains, it says, and have not love, I don't have anything. It's all about love, you all. It's all about love. Now, you know that in your heart. You know that. And it's not just about romantic love. I'm not talking about that. Or I'm not talking about liking or, or even uh, um, a human love. I'm not talking about it. Even love for your child or your husband or your wife or your family. That's still all about you. This is sacrificial love. This is love like Jesus. You talk about wanting to be like Jesus. Well, he suffered for you. He, he was the lamb slain. And he, he's come back inside of you. If you're, if you're, if you're mature, you're going to understand what I'm talking about. You're going to be the one that has laid his life down. And you're not going to go around proud because you've suffered so much. Now, that's not it either. either. You see, that's, that's not wisdom either. We're talking about people that pretty much suffer silently. Why? Because it's not about me and my suffering. It's about what Jesus is bringing about through this suffering that I might go, be going through and how I can actually be for others. And then it says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I mean, people can give everything to the poor and have not, and though I give my body to be burned, you can do all those things and have not sacrificial uh, love, that uh, agape love, it profits me nothing. How do I have agape love? Well, there's only one way. God is love. He doesn't have it to give you. <laughs> he is it. So all you have to know is, Jesus, you're in me and you are love. I don't feel like I, I have the, I, I'm, I'm manifesting this kind of love. I don't feel like I, I'm always offended when people do things that get me, against me and I'm always defending myself and justifying myself. And I don't feel like I have that kind of love. Well, take it by faith that you're in union with the lover and he lives in you and he is that love. Watch the Holy Spirit bring that into manifestation. But you see, he's defining it, defining what love is. And he says uh, people can do wonderful, great things. And if, it doesn't, if there's not love behind it, it doesn't profit you anything. Now, the, here, here is it, here's what love looks like. Love suffers long, long suffering. Okay, Jesus in you is long-suffering and is kind. I mean, you know, we're pretty curt a lot of times and we're nasty to one another and, 
we don't have patience and I, I find that with myself sometimes I don't have patience with my husband so I have to say no that's not true I have patience so I'm not going to condemn myself because I feel like I don't have patience I'm saying no you are my patience Jesus Claire uh, love envies not it doesn't I'm not comparing myself with somebody else and thinking oh my gosh they've got it better if they've got more than I do they have more money they have a greater house they have they look better they have a better body than I do they have a they have prettier face than I do and better skin we don't even do that love doesn't care love's not puffed up it's not trying to be something apart from Christ you know uh, A.B. Simpson said a great thing A.B. Simpson said humility is not being uh, it's not be thinking little of myself it's not thinking of myself at all. <laughs> Humility is not thinking little of me. It's not thinking of myself at all. Well, how can I not think about myself at all? The way you do is uh, get over yourself because it's not about you. It's about the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit pouring out of you, blessing everybody else. That's what it's about. So how can you be puffed up when it isn't even you? If you think you're doing it, you might be puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly doesn't get out of order it stays in order you see seeks not its own it's not about me <laughs> I say that a, a, a lot of times I'll say that it's not about us it's not about me it's about how Jesus is going to bless you so even when I'm in a conflict with somebody and the other day I was somebody said something and I said no that's not true and it was just something, somebody we saw on TV, it wasn't a spiritual problem at all. It was something, somebody we saw on TV and they said, I know who that person is. And they named the actor. And I said, no, that's not that actor's name. And they said, yes, it is. And I said, no, it isn't. And there we were in the middle of something, right? In the, right. Well, I mean, I ended up being right. But you know what? I dropped it because I thought, what difference does it make? I don't want to be making her wrong. Why, why do I care? You know, she'll see it. And she did, and we dropped it. So it's not that I'm trying to make the other person wrong because I'm always right and I've got the right answer. You die to the being right. I mean, that's love. It says, uh, rejoice not in iniquity. I'm not happy when the body of Christ is not operating from who they, who they are. I'm, it, it grieves me. It grieves me, and it should grieve all of us. It says, but rejoices in the truth. And that's certainly what we do. That's why we praise the Lord. Let, let everybody praise the Lord. And because it is the truth about who you are that will set you free. Bears all things. So we take things. I mean, for years, I, uh, my husband, I, like I, I've given this testimony before and I'm not talking out of school. So my husband and I do marriage seminars sometimes and we talk about this. Well, um, uh, I lived with him and he had a terrible temper. He was going to be in control and I was going to be wrong and I was going to do what he said 24-7 and we all lived in fear. Well, after the Lord really uh, built me up on the inside, I was no longer afraid of him. And so, and yeah, you do have to bear a long time sometimes with people. You labor a long time. And yes, you do get disgusted. I think Jesus got disgusted with his disciples sometimes. He'd say, oh, you have little faith. Come on, grow up. Sometimes you feel that way and you do say it. But basically, he knew they couldn't really have what he had until the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. And then he told them, you're going to have more than I have. So, I mean, that's a leader too. Is somebody that says, you know, yeah, you glean everything I've got to give. But basically, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and anoints you, you're going to be greater than me. And I, I love to say that to people. And believes all things. And it's not a naivety. It's not like we're just naive and we don't. We, we discern, but we're simple towards evil. It's a, it, the Bible says that. He, it says, be simple towards evil. Be wise as serpents, but simple towards evil. Well, yeah, I'm wise, so I know that I know when things aren't right. But it's not about me just trying to prove I'm right. I mean, so many people love arguing. I don't. I would rather be wrong. <laughs> now, when it comes to uh, the foundational doctrine truths, 
you're not gonna you're not gonna get me on that one because I will not give on that one. <laughs> I'm sorry, I won't. One time I had a the theologian argue with me, and bless his soul, I love him. He's a dear brother of mine, and we uh, agree to disagree on some of these problems. But you know, he said, "You're really a bulldog. You're not gonna give on what you know. What I know to know." That I know, that I know is spirit truth, is spirit truth to me. And, you know, the gates of hell cannot come against it. And, and neither can a theologian nor any Bible teacher. What I know to know to know is the truth. I can't give on it because it is the truth. So, endures all things. So, we do endure all things. But uh, love never fails. And I love that. Love never fails. Sacrificial Love never fails. I have a friend that has lived with a devil. Her husband has been devilish for years, and uh, she loves him, so that she stays. People make fun of her because she stays. Well, she, when God calls you for a, a place to stay, you stay. And when God releases you, he might, you know, release her to move on. I don't know, but I don't think so. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. See, all these gifts of the Spirit, they're not, they're only temporary. They're not to be here forever. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. So see, uh, we have these gifts and we, we operate from them and we get, we share with the body of Christ because we're meant to edify each other in love. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Why? Because the one new man is coming. I mean, we might be coming to the very uh, end of all things when the Lord will, uh, with a shout, come and come get us. So we're, we're, that could be happening real soon here. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. So honestly, on this side of things, we're still seeing things in part. And if you're still, uh, if you're still not mature, you're not going to see the whole yet. So basically, I think that's what he's saying here. I'm not going to take it out of context because I really believe he's talking about the immature and the mature. He's talking about the difference between the immature and the mature here. When we know in part, we prophesy in part. Um, there's a scripture in Numbers talking about Moses and uh, Aaron. Aaron was a prophet, Moses, and it says, and, and God is making a distinction between the prophets and Moses. And he said, the prophets uh, speak in dark speeches. They don't see the fullness. But by Moses, uh, he, he's mouth to mouth to me. In other words, I'm, he's speaking what I'm saying. So there is a difference between a prophecy and really the uh, anointing, a Moses anointing, which the, the apostles had as well. And so, um, and that's what he's saying. You, we can all grow up to, to, uh, to these callings that God has called us to. And when uh, that which is perfect or complete is come, when you know your completeness in Christ, then that which is in part shall be done away with. You won't be partial. You won't be in part. You won't know in part. You'll know the fullness. When you know the fullness of Christ within you and who you really are, and you operate from that, then you're not seeing in part. You're, you've, you, because it says this. So I know he's talking about the immature here. A lot of people misinterpret this scripture. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. So he's talking about childish things, what, which is being impartial and dividing and thinking your gift is greater and being puffed up and uh, arguing over the gifts and all that. I understood as a child. Okay, so that's how children understand. That's how my granddaughter would go to my closet and w walk around in my shoes. One of these days I knew she would fill them, but then, but they weren't filled th then. So wait on your calling, the Bible says. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away my childish things. So that's what he's calling them to do. For now we see through a glass darkly. That's meaning when we're still childlike, childish. But then face to face. In other words, when you're grown up face to face. Now, you know, one time I was um, hearing people teach about seeing, uh, about Moses knowing God face to face and uh, some of the prophets knowing God face to face. And all of a sudden I got a different point of view of what that meant because everybody is thinking it's like God's face is out here to my face and I'm face to face to God. 
Well, I started thinking, now, wait a minute. The face of God is within me. So the being face to face has the fullness of Christ in me in his face pressing out through my face. That's face to face. His mouth speaking out the words that he has me speak out, that's face to face. And that's maturity. That's knowing our fullness and our completeness in Christ. And, um, and I told that minister that when he taught that. I said, would you consider this? Just consider it. And I think he did. And he started teaching that way later. And, and thank God, I think he really got that point. I mean, we always think in separation first. Let's stop thinking in separation. Let's think about the fact that we, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit with, we've got the Lord within us. My spirit is joined to his spirit. My soul is joined to his soul. My body is joined to his body. So we have the bodily presence of Christ within us, and that's face to face. And that's knowing our maturity in Christ, and that's knowing our fullness in Christ. And now about its faith and hope and, ch and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. There's nothing greater than love, nothing greater. Um, I have a friend called Fran Giles. If you come to our conference, and let me uh, tell you again about our conference, we're ha we always have it the, the week in after Mother's Day. That's in May, and it's spring. We love having it in spring, and uh, it reminds us of, that we're already resurrected with Christ. And so uh, you're invited to come. But this precious saint, a friend of mine, Fran Giles, she calls herself Fran Love Giles, and she has the parentheses around the love or quotations around the love. And that is the truth. Love pours out of that precious woman 24-7. And uh, even if she doesn't know great scriptures and great um, intellectual things, she is so filled with the Spirit of God that everybody is just so blessed by her. And so what is greater, to know or to be? <laughs> That's the point. You have been listening to The Liberating Secret with Sylvia Pierce. We want to send a special thank you to all our supporters who make this program possible. If you have been blessed by this program and would like to contact Sylvia, you can write her at P.O. Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. That's Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. You can also find more of Sylvia's teachings on her website. The web address is www.theliberatingsecret.com. That's www.theliberatingsecret.com. And be sure to listen again right here Monday through Friday at the same time for The Liberating Secret with author and teacher Sylvia Pierce. So until next time, may God richly bless you.